In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Professor Julia Steinberger, a researcher in ecological economics and industrial ecology at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Julia gives us an in-depth look at how insidious the behaviour of the fossil fuel industries really is. Their strategy is to demoralise and undermine us, to ensure that we no longer strive to get rid of their destructive products. Importantly, we discuss the Energy Charter Treaty, or ECT, that is currently being used by the fossil fuel industry to undermine efforts to get rid of fossil fuel infrastructure. No matter how daunting all this may be, it is imperative that collectively we do what we can to brighten the future outlook. As Julia says, the hour is always darkest before dawn. This summary version is edited from the full interview, included are the key points from the discussion, and the full version can be accessed by all YouTube and Patreon members. Thank you for listening. Julia, welcome to the Climate Gen podcast. I want to start by asking you, from your research, what do you see as the obstacles to real mitigation and eventually living within set limits? Hi, Nick. So I think that there are a couple of major reasons that we haven't been able to do more and really sort of face the problem. I think the first one has to do with not recognizing the central role played by the fossil fuel industry. So I think that a lot of people from policymakers to media, pundits, journalists, to uh, climate scientists themselves really just hoped that the fossil fuel industry could be convinced that climate change is real, it's a real problem, and that they should be on the right side of history somehow and reorient their industry to towards renewables and other kinds of products. And the fact is that the fossil fuel industry, as we now know, Um, not only knew about climate change way back when, but they had better climate models than, you know, university scientists or the IPCC. So this is something we know from a recent article by Jeffrey Supran, Naomi Oreskes, and Stefan Ramstorff in Science Magazine. And so the the lesson from that, I think, is really that this industry should never have been taken seriously as a partner. They're not energy companies. That was this illusion that you get from models where you say, oh, well, you make one kind of energy, well, you could make another kind of energy. But that's not how these companies operate. They really identify with their products, and they really identify with petroleum, gas, and coal. And for them, that's the name of the game. They don't want to switch to the other companies, and they have the political power to enforce dependency on their products through regulatory means, through state capture, through getting subsidies. So they're really very good at sort of making themselves the sort of the spider at the heart of the web and just getting resources and power and influence and keeping their business model going. The second biggest problem is refusing to think about reducing demand. So there's been this, again, this illusion or ideology, in this case, it's much more of an ideology and a worldview that says that growth is progress and that growing energy use is progress, is human development, is emancipation, is how we make the world a better place. And that's absolutely not true. So that's what my research looks at is how we can reduce demand and live good or better lives. And that's entirely possible because we have lots of technologies and ways of doing things very, very differently that would allow us to reduce demand and change demand. In the case of uh, food, for instance, change towards plant-based diets and reduce energy demand. And the fact that we've had this ideology that's that said that demand growth was untouchable, that it was impossible to do research on it and be taken seriously, it was impossible to write it about it in the IPCC reports, that has made our life a lot harder in terms of trying to get those policies passed. So policies around energy sufficiency and demand reductions. So that's uh, I would say that those are the two main things, the role of the fossil fuel industry and uh, the possibility of demand reduction. Okay. And you mentioned your research about uh, living well within these sort of limits. Can you talk a little bit about how you would apply that? Because going back as well to the fossil fuel industry being at the center of this web and being so powerful, does your research suggest a way through that? So there, there's two different things. One is the possible world, which is where we observe, you know, what's happening in the world around us. And we see that certain countries, certain households live quite good lives at much, much lower resource use than, you know, even their their national averages or global averages. So that's something that we can uh, we can definitely observe and in the reality that we know it's happening. And we can also model what would be possible based on the efficiency trajectory of existing technologies. And we can really see that it is possible to live better with less, and it would be possible to live better with a lot less in the future. The other aspect of reality is how do we face the fossil fuel industry? And that's a much taller order. I think one of the things it really requires is experience exposing them, either through research, through investigative journalism, through media reporting, 
and also through the lawsuits that are happening now. So right now, they've been spending a lot of their time building up what we call social license, which is a social license to operate. And that social license did not, does not have a reason to exist. They have been acting in such a way that their social license should be removed. But I think that that's much more of a communicative challenge, making people aware of what these products are doing and the fact that they knew about this and that they were collaborating with the automotive industry to fudge the results and all of this stuff. So all of these things need to be exposed and for people to understand that that this is not a good actor. This is not, these are not good faith actors. The emissions curve is still sort of going up or it may be stabilizing, but we've reached a point now in 2023 where we're going to a COP where the president is literally the oil boss. That's kind of symbolic of the political failure really to tackle the problem. We're treating them like partners when you're when you've highlighted the reasons why yeah. we shouldn't. And I just want to know what you think of the role of personal agency when we see the political failure to really get to grips with it. And there's a lot of people who are saying, as individuals, we can't really do anything. But what do you see as the role of personal agency in all of this? Going to, to what you said, which is very important about the next COP, so the next round of climate negotiations being run by an oil man. You know, that's literally what he is. He's an oil man. He's the head of the national oil company, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. So I think that one of the things we can see is we can see the arc of struggle as described or by Gandhi. It's not a direct quote, but it sort of encapsulates what he was thinking is, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And we're definitely, I mean, we've been, the, the ignoring thing happened, the laughing at, you know, that's sort of the overt climate denial happened. And this is the fight, right? This is an overt fight. This is the fossil fuel industry, oil companies trying to take over climate action, uh, you know, trying to enforce climate inaction, basically, by taking over uh, key processes. Um, I was part of the IPCC as a lead author. And, you know, the oil companies would comment on our text and say, you know, delete this paragraph. It's like, do you got a reason? You know, is that, a, is that a, do you have a scientific reason why this paragraph should be deleted? Is there any factual thing that's incorrect in it? No, just delete. It's like, well, no, then that if you don't, you know, we don't have to do what they say, right? But I think you, you see this sort of confrontation coming up very, very strongly. And I think that one of the most important things that people can do in their personal life is be part of that confrontation actively. So be part of any of the activist groups that are basically standing up in the sense, you know, on the more sort of spicy side, you have Just Stop Oil or the direct action groups like Extinction Rebellion and so on, Fridays for Future, various kinds of other groups that do more sort of either lobbying or the lawsuits, which are very important. So Client Earth, there's the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is an excellent initiative to take get involved in because it's really trying to make the fossil fuel industry appear in international diplomacy as the you know grand villain that it is, much like nuclear weapons. So I think the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty is a really excellent initiative to get involved in. One thing you mentioned recently, which I found quite fascinating, was about the Energy Charter Treaty. Yes. And it struck me this is something that really needs to be on people's radar much Absolutely. more. Can you give us an overview of, of just what it is and the role it's playing at the moment of protecting this sort of status quo with the fossil fuel companies? So the Energy Charter Treaty um, started out its life as a European treaty that also included the Eastern Bloc. It now includes a couple of other countries like Japan and I think Australia. And it's trying to also expand into Africa, which is really bad. It's exactly like the tobacco industry where the moreover man never died. He just moved to Africa. And the tobacco industry moved to Africa and tried to make lots of African people dependent on cigarettes and die with lung cancer. And the same is now happening with the fossil fuel industry. So the Energy Charter Treaty started out as a way for West Western Europe to guarantee that they would pay for investment in pipelines from the Eastern Bloc to Western Europe. And that treaty basically doesn't have a purpose to exist anymore. We're not in that kind of situation anymore. But what it's been used as, it's been used as a vehicle, as, a, as an instrument to for fossil fuel companies to stop climate action. And the way it works is that if a fossil fuel company is in one country, let's say Switzerland, for reasons that will become clear, and the Danish government decides that they want to do something differently, or the Italian government decides that they want to act on climate and they don't want to have any more drilling in the Adriatic Sea, for instance. Well, that company can sue in a lawsuit, that's a binding lawsuit, they can sue sovereign countries in the rest of Europe to stop them from having this climate action, and they sue them for lost profits. And the example of Italy and the Adriatic Sea is a real example. A UK company called Rockhopper sued the Italian government because the Italian government said, 
guess what, guys? No more drilling in the Adriatic Sea. And because Rockhopper had been exploring, like they'd gone over, you know, with a ship like a couple of times with a sonar or something. Um, and they were able to sue the Italian government for hundreds of millions of dollars or euros or whatever and win. They won. The Italian government has, has to pay them for lost profit because Rockhopper said that they would have drilled and made that much money and the treaty agreed with them. So the tribunal set up by the treaty, which is a very untransparent process, agreed with uh, with Rockhopper. And, you know, the worst part of it is that Italy wasn't even in the treaty at the time when this lawsuit happened. Italy had already left the treaty, but the treaty has a 20 year sunset clause, which means that it's still binding for 20 years after any sovereign country leaves it. So that means that this treaty by itself is enough to stop the Paris Agreement from happening. And it means that this treaty, not only do individual countries have to leave for it to stop, but it basically has to be dynamited on the way out, which means that a, a whole large group of countries, like the entire European Union, has to leave it. Now, the reason we know what this treaty does, because it was very not transparent and nobody really knew what it was, except that these tribunals are happening, but even that's not transparent. We don't even know how many there are what the lawsuits amounts are, we don't, it's very hard to get full information on it. It's because there was a whistleblower called Dr. Yamina Saheb. She's also an IPCC author. And she basically went to be part of that treaty to try to make it Paris compliant with the Paris Agreement and understood what it was doing and understood that it couldn't be made Paris compliant because it was basically this thing that just helped the fossil fuel industry stay in business. And we know, for instance, that the Danish environment minister, who's in charge of climate action, said that they didn't do as much as they wanted because of this treaty. So we know that it's been having this chilling effect across all of Europe. And so because of her whistleblowing and her intervention in different countries, she's been able to persuade or convince politicians in multiple countries to leave the treaty, including Spain, the Netherlands, Poland, Germany, France, and Italy, as we know, had already left. And then the European Commission was just like, okay, we all have to leave now. But Switzerland is deciding to stay in. And the reason Switzerland is deciding to stay in is because Switzerland has basically made this bargain with the devil. You know, and I'm in Switzerland right now. I live and work in Switzerland. I'm Swiss. The Switzerland has made this devil's bargain where they think that by having the headquarters of big evil companies like Glencore, for instance, or petroleum trading companies like Trafigura, that that's what our economy is built on. Our economy is built on this kind of sort of predatory financial headquarters of major dirty industries, and that we will make a lot of money if we're the last country standing that's upholding this treaty, because fossil fuel companies will come to Switzerland, set up their headquarters, and sue the rest of the world into climate inaction. And that's something that the Swiss government is pursuing right now. But in a very undemocratic way, because you know 99.9% .9 of the Swiss population has no idea that this treaty exists. And 99% of the politicians that are elected to the parliament don't know that we're part of it and don't know what it does. So this, this thing is only allowed to continue to exist because of lack of transparency and ignorance. It kind of creates a zombie fossil fuel industry where they can just keep yep. suing for money on business that hasn't even occurred. Absolutely. And even as, as Europe pulls out all these other countries are being conned into joining. Is that fair? Yeah, that's that's basically what's what's going on. And they're just going around the world and sort of wooing African countries, trying to convince them to join. That is going to be this great thing for them to join, that they're going to be part of the club. But it's really a coercive treaty that is anti-democratic, anti-transparent, and goes against the public interest of every single last person on the planet. If people want to learn more, Celine Keller who's a fantastic uh, graphic artist, made a graphic novel about it called The Dawn of the ECT, which is uh, freely downloadable in multiple languages. So I recommend that. Well, that's been fantastic to speak to you. Thank you very much. It's been very insightful and uh, hopefully speak to you again in the future. Thanks, Nick.